Welcome, Andrew. Thank you so much for coming on today. My pleasure, Paula. It's fun being <laughs> on the other side of the questions. <laughs> I'm going to ask you a question. Is How did you get your first photography job? <laughs> oh, really? Is that my first question? Uh, well, my, my, I started out as a fishing photographer of all things. And that, that's how I got into photography. And that was, a, that was so I get paid to write articles for fishing magazines. But in regards to my own business, it was a wedding. I, um, I photographed a friend's sister's wedding and uh, just charged her for double expo, double prints. And so we had a, a sample album. We went off to a bridal expo and absolutely killed it at that expo, booked so many weddings. And uh, that was it. I was off and running. What do you think it was about that? I mean, you only had one wedding under your belt. Had you studied much like wedding photography? Like what do you think was the catalyst for the success there? Two things. So I, I did already, I mean, I'd learned a lot through photographing for the fishing magazines because I had to shoot on transparency film. So that was a great way to look. It's like shooting on JPEG today where if you don't get your exposure right, then it's it's a wasted shot. So that you had to learn how to shoot well. Then I assisted another photographer at his weddings for um, five or six or seven. And so, you know, I, I sort of learned the ropes a little bit there. And then the, the wedding that I photographed, the friend's sister, she was quite a large girl. They were a large couple. And I was the only photographer, and there were heaps of us at this expo. I was the only photographer that showed a larger couple in my display album. And I booked all the larger couples at this expo. Yeah, <laughs> it was right. Crazy. And this is crazy to me because I see this a lot with uh, photographers that I work with, that they're constantly sort of showing model types and they're forgetting about the real person. Do you find the same? Like, Exactly. You know, and, and to be fair and truthful, I really wanted to photograph the model types because that's what I saw all the other photographers are doing. And that's what I saw in all the magazines at the time. Uh, so I wanted that. But, you know, beggars can't be choosers when you start. And I, I learned a big lesson. Like there is such a huge market out there that aren't models. Mm. I think that's such a great lesson to learn early on in your career, because I know that I spent the first couple of years of my wedding career building albums full of the young 21 year old hot girls, but I wasn't showing the average woman herself so that she could see herself in my photos. Very expensive mistake to make early on. You were, you were lucky. Oh, it's, a, it's an untapped market. It really is. <laughs> Fantastic. So uh, obviously you've been in business for quite a while now, Andrew, and you have a really established business where you've got associate, associate photographers working with you. I was curious to sort of step in and, and ask you questions about how you found bringing in photographers and letting go of that trust factor when you're sending out other people to go on jobs for you. Well, that, that was the scariest thing, Paula. I mean, it's, it started even outsourcing, uh, you know, we, the, the first studio assistant we had was a, a young girl who was finishing high school and it was scary letting her even, you know, cut up photo. We used to get photos in, um, on big sheets, 20 by 30 sheets and cut them up or she, you know, letting her design albums or do sales, all those things really tough. But once I realized that, oh my God, I've got so much more time to do other things. If I do let go, it wasn't as scary letting go with the photography, um, mm -hmm. especially once we found the right person to start with. So we we, we had a, a really fantastic photographer, competitor, Corey, who, uh, who went digital when I did. And he was an incredibly talented photographer, but hated business, hated all the admin stuff that went on behind the scenes. So I said, listen, how about you come and shoot for us? I'll pay you and you just hand over the files at the end of the day. You don't have to do another thing. Just shoot. That was a that was a godsend for him, and he was an in, he's still working with us today. Is incredible. Yeah, wow. And I think that when you're a small business owner, it can be really. I find a lot of my friends who are in business, not even necessarily photographers, but they can speak a little bit with a bit of irritability about having staff and the necessity for staff. But I think when you can find the right people, then it can help your business to grow immensely. Right? Like obviously. Well, yeah. Absolutely. Even, even, you know, with the podcast that I have, um, I have people helping with that too. It just, it just frees up time to do other things in the business. And, you know, whether that's, I mean, look, it could free up time to give me more spare time with my family or doing the things I want to do or to work more on the business rather than in the business. So yeah, look, there's advantages no matter which way you look at it, but there are, there are headaches that go with it too. So, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say it's all roses, but it's a lot easier to grow with help. Yeah, but how, okay, so here's the thing. You've had somebody, how long has Corey been with you? 
uh, 15 years. Yeah. So what's the secret to keeping someone for that long? <laughs> <laughs> um, paying them well. <laughs> <laughs> obviously but I think a fear of a lot of photographers is that you'll train someone you'll give them all the secrets and then they'll go and do it on their own I've heard that said by a lot of photographers that are friends of mine that they kind of get a little bit miffed when the person kind of outgrows their business and moves on have you had that experience yourself with people coming through no but but look I I agree with that somewhat so what my philosophy has always been I would never ever show uh or, or teach Corey the marketing and sales side of the business, but then I would never teach, you know, Crystal or Tennille or Simone how to how to shoot because they do the sales and the marketing. So I like to keep the, the those two roles uh, totally separate. And I would never teach one person how to do it all because that's what I know how to do. Mm. That, that's setting them up to be a competitor. Now, I don't know. Maybe that's a a small minded way to look at it. But to me, I'm operating in a pretty small area, and I don't want to produce another competitor. Now I, I did take another photographer under my wing to show him the ropes and, and without a word of a lie, his photos started popping up, you know, alongside mine in magazines and newspapers because we used to get shown off in the newspapers. And I, I'd look at it and think, is that my photo? And it yeah, was, right. it was, it was distress. I was so cranky. I'd shown him way too much. And, uh, and so that was a lesson learned for me. So yeah, look, I do agree with those other photographers, but I would, um, learn my, I did learn my lesson and I would keep those two things separate now. Yeah. Right. Great. That's really great advice. Thanks for, thanks for sharing that. Now I want to move a little bit because you did mention it. You obviously have a hugely popular podcast, Photo Biz X. I want to, um, ask what prompted you to start that in the first place? <laughs> Uh, that was uh, uh, 10 years ago or more and or just over. And I, I was a mad keen listener of podcasts. And I, I really, I, I had one for the wedding photography business. And, and what I loved about that was um, I learned how to podcast and yeah, right. uh, and do all the things that went with it. But what happens with with weddings is, you know, you serve a, serve a client or a couple and then they're gone until they have kids maybe. Whereas mm -hmm. I wanted to have a podcast where I could have a real community and have people listen in every week. So I had the idea for Photo Biz X because I thought, why not create a podcast that I would want to listen to that isn't out there? And um, Linda, my wife, she who, who works with me in the business, she said, well, listen, if you're going to take a day off or more a week to do this, it has to pay for itself. And that was the incentive to produce content that is worth paying for. Mm -hmm. And um, it went from there. Yeah, fantastic. Over 500 episodes under your belt. Congratulations, because that really shows a level of commitment that you have to your community, which I think is just phenomenal. Um, I wanted to ask you a little bit about what you've learned as an artist and a creative from the photographers that you're, that you're interviewing, because every single week, it seems that you are like with some of the world's top photographers having these in-depth conversations and just being able to glean from them. Do you find that at all that can get a little bit overwhelming for your own business, if that makes sense, like trying to kind of adopt things or adapt or take things into your own business? Or did you find that you were sort of secure enough in your own business pr practices that you didn't need to constantly be changing based on what someone was kind of sharing? So I guess there's two parts to that, to that answer. One is, yes, it's very hard not to be inspired and uh, motivated to, to implement new things. But I was, also, I was also confident in what I had in my own business. So I would make small changes and tweaks. Um, I guess if I was to start over, I would probably do things totally different to, uh, mm -hmm. to what the way I did them. I'm uh, not, not regretting the way I did them, but I think there's better ways to make more money or be more profitable more quickly. Um, and no, I, 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 what, what I love about the podcast and doing all those interviews is knowing that there is so many ways to be successful and there's so many little things we can to make our businesses better without overhauling the whole thing. So no, I get more inspired than, um, than put off by it. Yeah, no, that's great to hear. Cause I think a lot of the people that I know in my community, they can probably get a little bit, maybe overwhelmed and jaded from constantly listening and learning not implementing have you sort of seen the trend like that come up with all of this content that we have that you and I didn't have when we were starting out you know um do you find that you sort of are coming up against that sometimes or have you seen a, a like a an acceleration of that in more recent times 
Yeah, no, look, that, that definitely happens. And look, it happens to me too when I listen to other podcasts and I've heard it from my listeners. Oh my, how, how are we ever meant to implement everything we hear? Well, the answer is you're not. You know, you, you take out the bits and pieces that are applicable to you and your business. Um, I, I say to my listeners, you don't need to listen to every single episode or if you do, you don't need to implement everything you hear. You pick out a nugget here, a nugget there. And that's, you know, choose something that resonates with you or that you can use and go on. But, but like you said, go and implement that and uh, and just listen out for the other ideas because there's, there are so many good ideas out there which only remain ideas or entertainment unless you implement them. Yeah. But not, you know, it'd be crazy to think you have to implement everything you hear because that's impossible. And I think that's probably where it comes to is, is like really sort of, as you say, gleaning the nuggets, but also you can't, if you keep doing radical changes in your business, you can't actually test and measure what the thing was that got the results either. So I sort of, you know, for me, I'm always trying to say just if you can is just make minor changes, but keep an eye on it then and, and watch what the change does or does it take effect or hold? Because I know myself, I've done radical flips in my business over the years. And, you know, when you, especially in things like Facebook ads or stuff like that, where you're actually putting money down, it can be expensive mistakes that you can make if you're not really keeping your eye on it. So have you sort of tra- done that in your own business? Have you found that you've kind of like just made the incremental changes and that's made significant difference for you too yeah yeah i i can i can relate i mean you you're especially you're you're um i don't want to say one of a kind but you're amazing you change whole genres <laughs> i mean i yeah. haven't done that. <laughs> <laughs> that that is a big move but what, one of the one of the big lessons i learned i i, I was I, I heard it i did an interview and um i can't it was one of the photography business coaches and we're talking about uh, cost of goods, you know, and the impact they have on your business. And I thought, you know what, I could take out wedding albums from my packages, have them as an upsell option and my cost of goods come down and I'm all profit. Mm-hmm. And to me, like it made perfect sense, but what happened? My business tanked and I, I like it would, it, we nearly went broke because, because I took the albums out. And what I realized afterwards is the albums are one of the the biggest marketing tools that I have in my business because the, the women or the, the girls, the couples that get married, they go and show those albums to their friends and family. And that's where most of my bookings were coming from, you know, over and above Facebook ads and SEO on my website. That was my biggest and best business card out there. And if it wasn't included in the package, it was more difficult to sell the album afterwards, but it was a lot easier if I had an album included, almost if I gave it away with my base package to upsell extra album pages. So you know, that, that was a massive lesson learned and one that opened my eyes to you know, n- not every bit of information from every photographer or guest or coach is going to be right for my business. Mm, that's a huge lesson to learn and an expensive one as well. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well it's nice. know it. <laughs> and, and this is the thing, I guess, I mean, you've got the same sort of experience uh, from weddings as I do. I, I grew up sort of understanding that a lot of the profit from the weddings was in what I could do afterwards in terms of like upselling pages or selling prints. And back in the day, we used to sell orders to the families, you know, in the little folders and stuff like that. So yeah. a lot of that was, was there. And I, there was that sort of conundrum, I guess, in the day when the shoot and burners kind of, kind of came into the market, I felt the same pressure. I was like, Oh, well, maybe I just need to sort of reduce everything, take stuff out. I did a similar thing to you and very quickly went, no, 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 same thing. Albums, you know, that capacity to keep making money afterwards, to you know and the marketing potential so I'm so glad that you brought that up because I hadn't even thought of it myself but it's these little mistakes that you make and you learn from along the way you do you do (laughs) so how do you think is well what do you credit I think to your sustainability in like the photography industry over time yeah, you know, I, I was thinking about this, or, or, or you know, I guess a, a version of your question now before we started recording, and uh, you, 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 I don't know if you were around because you're not as old as me, but were you around when we went from dig, uh, film to digital? Yes, I was. I got a D one in Nikon D one in 1999. So, <laughs> I guess you were shooting film before then. 
Yes. I only shot film for six months though. And then I did hybrid. So I did film and digital because I didn't trust the digital for about another six to eight months and was sort of like double handling everything. And then went fully in. I remember it was September of 2000. That was all in on digital cameras. Or was it 2000 that we had our first digital? No, it was September of 2000 was the first digital wedding that we shot and then it was another 12 months after that that it was like let's pack the film away we're we're off to the races so right well yeah. so, so that that whole era I went through the same era I mean I was shooting film for a bit longer than you and uh, then my first camera was a Nikon D1X and I remember I paid eleven thousand three hundred dollars for it which was crazy and we were paying a dollar a megabyte for our SD cards or whatever our compact flash cards back then which it just just blows my mind today and if you if you're listening just do the sums on that one dollar a megabyte however uh, though would you were you shooting medium format for weddings no no I only ever shot 35 mil so we were doing both and you know like it was sort of like the formal section of the wedding and some portraits of the bride and stuff like that would be in the medium format and that was really expensive to produce first you know first run 77 prints that would but they'd all end up in the album so i suppose the cost was kind of mitigated across that board but it was still quite expensive so yeah i know i remember we do you want to hear something really shameful and i'm almost embarrassed to admit this we sold a Leica to buy a digital camera that is no longer around but that Leica would have been absolutely a dream to have today <laughs> it's, it's funny because I I bought a Leica and then I sold it because I wasn't getting enough use and then I felt so bad I went and bought another one now I don't use it as much either and Linda's like you're gonna sell that camera I'm like no I'm just keeping it yeah, that's one of the ones that you keep. So my dad's actually just, um, because he's got a lot of my old gear as well, and he's just unpacked a Rolly. Do you remember the Rolly flexes? Yes. Yeah, and it's got all the lenses and stuff like that. So he's like, what are we going to do? Are we going to sell it? Because it's worth a lot right now. And I'm like, oh, I don't know. I just feel like I kind of want to hang on, but I'm never going to use it again, do you know? <laughs> I, I, I bought a, um, is it a copy? What's mine? Uh I've got like a, a copy, a Yashika Flex. Oh, wow. Oh, that's special. <laughs> that's special. But I bought this isn't that old. I only, only bought it a couple of years ago. And um, another one that Linda says I should sell because I don't use it enough. But I love it. <laughs> I don't have a partner to get me into trouble for hoarding things, but I've got like, I've got all my old like DSLRs sitting in, in the cupboard just here and they're all stacked down. <laughs> I don't know. I don't even think they'd be worth anything, those earlier digital cameras anymore, but still I can't let go. So. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Going back Sorry. to your question about, you know, longevity in the business, I, I think it was, you know, I'm the same as you, we, we were, and I was probably a bit quicker than you, but I was quick to adapt and move with the times. And I think what's happening right now with AI is going to affect you and your listeners, you know, just the same, exactly the same way that digital affected us film photographers back in our day. Mm -hmm. And I think you have to embrace it and run with it and do not put your head in the sand and feel like this is going away because uh, I, I think it's only going to get better and better and better. And um, I mean, I've, I've got some ideas, I've thoughts on how we could use it, but uh, yeah, I certainly wouldn't be running away from it. Yeah, I actually did an episode on this a couple of months ago. Same thing. I'm just totally geeking out on it. And I think it's because like you, I've r rode the wave of a major industry shakeup. And I saw a lot of, um, they would have probably been more my dad's peers that just held on a little bit too long to the film, in, uh, particularly in the weddings and where, you know, we could go off and sort of shoot 2,000, 3,000 images and sort of create these dynamic digital um, albums. These guys were still sort of hanging on to film, which don't get me wrong, I love the quality of film, but I think that you've got to adapt. You have to shift and move and you have to take advantage and be an early adopter of these things. Don't you agree? hundred percent. Cause I was, look, I was going to say the same thing that the, the photographers who were leading the, like leading the industry when I came in, I was a, I was a young whippersnapper up and comer that I was getting, you know, who are you? It was a real like um, closed shop amongst those other guys. Digital came out. There was a couple of like Corey and myself, we ran with digital and they, we, they were laughing at us saying that's never going to stand up. And uh, they were the first guys that all disappeared. 
You're probably yeah. at a lot of the same events and stuff. Like I used to go and see the likes of um, Martin Shembury and Lindsay Merritt, you know, all these boys. Yes. And they were, they were early adopters too of the digital stuff. So it was good to, yeah, to learn from them. Yeah. I went out with Martin Shembury. I, I, I saw him present and called him one day and said, can I come and assist you in a wedding? Like what a photographer. Oh, and yeah. uh, he was, yeah, he was superb. So I was lucky enough to be photographed by him with Ryan one time as, oh, as really? models at some event. Yeah, the two of us were the same age. And so they just go, you two look like you could be a wedding couple. Let's photograph you. <laughs> I was probably at one of those events. <laughs> <Probably>. <laughs> Great oh. stuff. So I interrupted you there and I don't want to spoil your flow. So can we go back on whatever it was you, you were just talking about? It was talking oh, look, about- I just think if, if, there's a, if there's a listener or a reviewer hearing this and thinking that AI is going away or you're not going to need to know it. I would be super scared to have that kind of thinking because they were the, that's how the other older guys were thinking when I was up and coming and there will be new and up and coming photographers that will embrace AI. And I, I think like you, I mean, I would be learning everything about it and, and becoming a service provider to my clients, offering it as a, as a service mm. and understanding how it works and how to get the most out of it. Because at the end of the day, our, our clients just want great photos of themselves. So if we can deliver that, whether that's with our cameras, you know, with the help of AI, then do it and charge for it. Yeah, exactly. I think I keep saying that to people. There's always going to be room for experts and people to hold people through, hold space for them and guide them through an experience. It's just the mechanism by which we do it is definitely going to be changing. I mean, I guess this was something that I was really keen to pick your brain on. And I guess this is like the perfect segue into it is what are you finding is kind of like exciting you about AI and how to, how to implement it in your photography business? To be, to be honest with you, Paula, I'm not using it at all in my business at this stage. Uh, I'm keeping an eye on it, but I mean, I, I have a different kind of clientele to you. I've got like portrait wedding, um, some commercial, but the photography, but it's all based on the, the people in the shots and what they look like right now with their, with their uh, family. So, you know, I'm not doing branding photography as such, but if I was, then yeah, look, I, I'd be embracing it because I look, I know I've had a look around online. I can see it's amazing. I can upload selfies of myself and get these incredible branding photos with different hairstyles, different backgrounds. But you know what? I, I had to go searching long and wide to find something that was half decent, but yeah. it, it's out. So why not become the photographer who can just offer it? And have it as an as a as an upcharge or an, an, an you know, something that you're uh, selling above and beyond what you're offering. Yeah, so I still sort of I guess I still sit on the fence a little bit about that myself at the moment because a, a lot of what I do with my clients and this is just for me is similar to the wedding in that we have an experience and they get to get made up. And so a lot of their emotional attachment to the images is attached to the experience of feeling empowered in themselves. So I wonder about that disconnect between the authenticity. Do you know what I'm saying? Like it would be interesting to test the market and see. Yeah, I do. So I, I still think they would have that engagement with you and have that, um, you know, still still have the makeup still like you still know how to take a better photo than they ever will with you know, as a selfie yeah. so imagine imagine putting your images into some incredible ai software and and I, I think the client will still love that you know i'm going to go and play with this tonight now don't you <laughs> I mean, I was looking at it from a chat GPT point of view and like editing point of view. That's where I've sort of covered it with my audience so far. But I have been having discussions inside of my membership to say to people like, this is where it's going. And I think we need to move quickly and adapt, you know, so I'm so glad you Absolutely. brought it up. Yeah. Yeah. Look, look, yeah, look sure, sure. Chat GPT and uh, imagine AI and, um, you know, culling software. Absolutely. I mean, that that's already there. I, I was thinking sort of the, the next step along where the client might think about not hiring a photographer, you know, because mm. they can upload their selfies and get their own branding photos. But I mean, imagine how much better your photos are going to look or, you know, your listeners' photos are going to look than a selfie that's uploaded. Yeah. And this was the conversation I had in my group the other day, because I was saying like, at the end of the day, a lot of what we do is filtering photographs, is sort of editing and removing things. What's the difference about like physically moving somebody into a different location or doing a different activity using AI? Like it's still got that element, our images, even though they're beautiful and they are still the person, they are still altered too, right? That's the reality. So <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree. I agree. 
<laughs> and you know, and you know what? And even even if a client or a potential client knows how to use AI software, who's to say they want to? Like, can they? Like, I don't want to go trolling through and finding the best website. I mean, if I'm going to have a great experience, going to get my hair and makeup done, uh, you know, and have a great experience with a photographer, then let's use those photos. And and you yeah. know what? Let's just let the photographer look after the whole lot. Yeah. And this is, I guess, you know, from a branding perspective too, I think a lot of my clients come to me, solopreneurs, no marketing team or anything like that. And so they're looking to me for guidance on how to visually bring it to life. So I don't think that skill set will ever be removed either. The way that I see them, the way that I see them from a visual storytelling point of view, that's not going to change. It just might change if I'm storytelling using the computer a little bit more as opposed to locations. Yeah. (laughs) Like again, I wouldn't be running away from it. I'd be looking at ways to embrace it and, and and sell it. Yeah, yeah, great stuff. I want to flick the switch a little bit and talk a little bit more about creating a business with lifestyle benefits because I think when I listen to your podcast, this is something that really emulates and it's a strong message that I get from you is that you're really helping Uh, photographers to create a business that suits their life rather than them serving the business. And this is something that I've become more and more passionate about being a child of the hustle culture, (laughs) you know, self-imposed, but having worked and worked and really kind of, you know, lost a lot of my social life in my youth um, from trying to like prove myself and say yes to everybody and be a yes person. How have you, did, did, did you have a similar journey? I'm curious because I I hear you sort of talking about lifestyle quite a lot. So did you have a time in your business where you weren't sort of experiencing a great quality of life? Yes. Yeah, I I did. So I I, I got to a point probably I think six, eight years into my business that I, I hated taking photos. I did, there's no photos of my kids like for a two or three year stretch because my camera bag was like my tool belt, you know, when I was, when I used to be an electrician a hundred years ago, uh, it, it was my, that was my tools. And I didn't want to go to work every single day. If I was at home with the kids, I didn't want to pick up the camera and go to work. And it was funny. I, when I started the podcast to talk about business, that's when I got re-inspired about photography, yeah, but it was, um, but I guess more to the point of your question, I read the book called the four hour work week. <laughs> yeah. So that was a, that was a life changer for me. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I've always loved holidays and travel and, and, and I th- why else do we have our own business? I mean, sure. If you, if you love working 60, 70, 80 hours, 80 hours a week, do that. I mean, it's perfect. You've got your own business. At least you're getting, you know, remunerated for it and uh, getting the, the rewards for, for the work you put in, whether that's monetary or for creating the art that you want to. But for me, lifestyle was way more important than, you know, making the next million dollars. That, so that that's that's the way I structure my life, the way Linda and I both do. Um, I I don't need to have the newest Mercedes or the next BMW. Uh, I don't need to um, I don't need to travel first class, but I want to travel often, and mm-hmm. I want to travel for long periods of time. Uh, I want I want to have a life. I mean, Linda, Linda jokes. <laughs> I don't know if she can hear me, but she jokes. She says, "If you die tomorrow, you should be happy." Because you've had a great life. I'm like, no way. I've got so much more I still want to do. But she's like, look what you've done. I was like, it doesn't matter. I've got way more I want to do. Uh, and it doesn't include only work, that's for sure. Yeah, I love this because uh, I guess I sort of had a similar transformation. That's when I moved from Sydney to the Sunshine Coast, I was effectively moving to try and get away from the business and the life that I'd created down there. So a lot of the reinvention didn't come from necessarily like the passion side of things. It came more from a necessity to change what I was doing radically, do you know? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but I wanted to ask you, cause I know when I sort of did a bit more deep diving on you that you have the a hundred strangers project and I'm curious to see, did, was that sort of part of the spark of the, the love and the passion coming back for you to take on something that wasn't necessarily about making money in the business? Yeah, hundred percent. And, and I'm sad to say that project isn't finished. Uh, that, that was because my my love of photography was uh, reinvigorated. Uh, and it also was a, a way for me to um, overcome some fears and, and you know, actually approach strange. I, I, wanted, I wanted to photograph people more than landscapes or anything else. 
And yes, I was getting paid by clients to photograph them, but I wanted to photograph people that I thought was interest that, that I thought looked or were interesting, interesting, and um, and hear a little bit more about them. And I guess people like um, Brandon, someone or other, what's his? I can't remember his name from the um, New York. What was his project? Oh, Faces yes. of New York or something yes. like that. Yeah, that was crazy. Yeah, people, people of New York. Yeah. Brandon Stanton, I think it was. Yes, yeah, so I think seeing things like that, I thought, you know, I, I can do that. I'm an interviewer. I'm a photographer. Why? But I had to get past that fear of actually approaching strangers. And uh, so that's why I started that project. And uh, yeah, I, I can do that now. And I guess that's probably why the project waned uh, once I got to 50 something. I, I can do that now. Um, I should go back to it, but I, I haven't yet. Do you know what? It's not too late for a rebrand, 60 changes, do you know? <laughs> Make it easier on yourself. Yes, yes. <laughs> Reinvent the project. Like eight more to do. <laughs> yeah. well, I find well, that a lot with the ladies. I'm done. <laughs> I find that a lot with um, clients of mine who are doing those 40 over 40 projects that the, the 40 is just like a target that they kind of, you know, they get to the, the 32, 33 mark and they're just like, I'm, I just want it to be over now. So <laughs> But I want to say to everyone listening is take on, passion, I get that. take on passion projects, but don't overwhelm yourself. <laughs> yeah. At, at least I didn't put a time limit on mine. I can do it in, I can finish it in 10 years time. It's still, it's an ongoing project. Exactly. Well, then you go, you've given yourself that caveat and that way out. So <laughs> Um, I wanted to just wrap it up here, Andrew, and say thank you so much because it's been so amazing to talk to you. And I want to share the great news about your podcast and your community. So can you tell us a little bit about what people, where people can find you and how they can join your community? Sure thing, sure. And this has been so much fun, Paula. Uh, it really has been. If anyone wants to check out my, my podcast, if you just go to photobizx.com or you can search uh, photobizx or photography business exposed, wherever you listen to podcasts, you'll find it. Um, you can access the free version of the podcast. If you like what you're hearing and you want to hear more, you can get a $1 30 day trial to hear the full interviews every week at photobizx.com. Thanks, Paula. And as you've listened, Andrew has a wealth of experience and just asks really great candid questions, which, yeah, I really enjoyed my, my interview with you. I thought it was, yeah, really great. And you, yeah, you just, you know how to ask the right questions. So it's a good experience. I've been on a few podcasts and sometimes the questions can be a little bit robotic and, you know, and, and a bit too structured, whereas you just let it meander. So it's really great because he knows how to pick people's brains in the right way. <laughs> 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 thanks Good. Paul I, I mean I, I love I really honestly I just ask the questions that I want to hear the answers to um you know whether that's how much you're earning or what you're charging or how you're getting your clients and um we go from there yeah I loved that nitty-gritty too because I think some people are afraid to talk about numbers and other people can sort of talk about numbers in a bit of a BS kind of a way. So it's really nice that you get really granular. And if you do pay to be part of his community, guys, there's a whole other section of the podcast that's released to you where you can really find out the nitty gritty of what that person's sharing, where he asked those questions. So it's well worth the investment. <laughs> Great stuff, Andrew. Thank you so much for your time and for your lovely energy today. And I know that everybody will be really interested in listening to this. So thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Paul. It's been a pleasure. Looking forward to having you back on the show. And account, you got you got to send me some of these AI generated photos when you get around to it. Yes, I will do. Don't you worry. <laughs> We're so salty. I'll still think about it. We can take my lamb out. I'll put on a tight show.